Good morning, church family. My name is Jeremy Miklak. I am the pastor of youth and family ministries here at Riverstone Church. VBS is here. I am so excited. I look forward to this week all year round. And I think part of why it's exciting is because we get to see so many young kids hear the message of Jesus Christ. And um, we know that as we come as part of the church family, that God calls us a part of his family. And it's so important that we are a part of his community, that having friends and fellowship and community is so part of how God has created us as people. But you know, there's also something to be said about even the love in a family between brothers and sisters. Raise your hand if you have any siblings or maybe like someone that's basically like a sibling to you. Well, there was two sisters and a brother and you know how it goes sometimes. Like when there's three, sometimes it's like the two sisters and the brother, they're fighting against each other. But you know, they spent a lot of their time together and they grew up in a very small town. So almost everybody knew everybody in the town. And these three siblings, they spent almost all of their time together as they grew up. They did house chores together. They would go into the marketplace to get the food to bring back to their home together. They would probably make up their own games as they were going to the market and make fun of each other a little bit here and there. They'd get into some trouble with their parents. But you know what? As they got older, the bond that they had when they were younger remained the same. They still remained very close to each other. They cared for each other. And there's something to be said about the love between siblings, especially when trouble comes, when there's adversity. Well, one day the brother, he became sick. The sisters knew that this was different than other times when the brother had become sick. You know, when he had been sick before, they were always the ones trying to make him get back in bed to rest because he was just trying to get up and go about and doing his business, what he wanted to do. But this time was different. They couldn't get him out of bed, even if he wanted to. He couldn't. And so they recognized that there was something different. Now, these three, the, the sisters and the brother, they had a, a best friend who became a teacher. He became well-known. And they knew that if they could get him here, they believed that he could get their brother better. So they sent word for this teacher. And they tried and they requested his attention to come as soon as he could because they knew that there was something about this sickness that was killing their brother. Well, they sent word for this teacher, but it wasn't too long before it was too late. And their brother, he lost his life to the sickness. They were grieving and they were mourning because this is really what they feared most in reality had come, that what they feared most had now become reality, that their brother had lost the fight with the sickness. Days had passed, they had put him in the grave, they were mourning his loss, and they had to relearn how to live. And we know for anybody who's lost a loved one what that's like, to learn how to live without someone that they've grown up with. Well, four days after this brother had passed away, four days this brother had been laying in his tomb, the friend finally showed up, the teacher finally showed up. I know there's often times when we feel like, God, why didn't you just show up when I needed you to? There's something that I need you to do for me, but you weren't there. You didn't show up in the way that I expected you to. Well, when this friend showed up, all they could do is cry. They had nothing left. The friend requested to see where they had placed the body. They brought the friend to the tomb. And many of us are familiar with this story in John chapter 11. Jesus is that friend. And Jesus went to the tomb and he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man, he came out. His hands and his feet, they were wrapped in the linen and cloth around his face. He was still covered in his grave clothes as he came out of the tomb four days after he was buried. And Jesus, he said to them, 
take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is a true story that just like in this story, today we celebrate that this same story represents us, that we have been taken out of the grave and placed next to the throne of the Almighty God. That this is what, when we think about VBS this week, that's what this theme is about. It is about being created in Christ, designed for God's purpose. So, a friend of mine showed me a couple signs to go along with this, so I'm going to show you, and we're going to practice it together throughout today's sermon, all right? So it's going to be made in Christ, made in, and then you're going to make a C like a sash coming across, Christ, made in Christ, all right? We're going to do it together throughout the sermon. We're going to remember it for the week ahead. But this amazing gift that God's given us, right, it's kind of like when we have our phone and we know that our battery's dying, but we use our phone all the time, so we need it. But we go to plug it into the charger and it still says 0%. What? The charger's not working. It's actually the battery. The battery, it needs to be replaced. The whole phone is dead without the battery. Or maybe it's like when we're playing... Fortnite or Apex Legends, maybe to some of you, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but you lose all of your health, and so when this happens, you're kind of like limping around, crawling around, waiting for someone else to revive you before you can get back and do the things that you need to do. Or maybe it's like when you play Super Mario and you have no lives, and across the screen it just says, game over, right? Well, for us, we take a look in Ephesians, and this is exactly what it says about us, without God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, it says this, And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It plainly says that we are dead we are dead in our sins. So what does this mean for us? Right now, physically, we are alive. We are dying physically because of our sins, but also at the same time, spiritually, the Bible says that we are dead. We are unable to appreciate and understand spiritual things. There is nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with God. There is nothing that we can do to please God. So what is sin? We kind of talk about it like this. Sin is anything that we think, say, or do that does not please God. Right? Anything that goes against God's standard of perfection is sin. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That because of that truth, everyone is dead spiritually separated from God, we are hopeless. There's nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with God. Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin. So even in our sin, the things that we deserve because of our sin is death. But I'm thankful that there's another part of that verse for the wages of sin is death. What we earned because of our sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we can be made right, not based on what we do, but because of Jesus, because of God's gift. In our house, we talk about the devil and the evil one. We call him the sneaky snake because that's how we first see him in the Bible. And the sneaky snake, he was someone that tempted Adam and Eve, the first created beings, when they were in the garden. They lived in a perfect place with a relationship with God. But the sneaky snake came, and he tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God. Now, this verse that we just read, it talks about that we now are working with the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Well, when we look at other scripture, we know that that's actually talking about the sneaky snake. 
that not only are we against God, but we're working for the sneaky snake. We're working for the evil one. We're in disobedience to God. So it doesn't mean that sinners like us, we only do evil all the time. That's not what it means. But it does mean that we can never do anything to merit or earn salvation, to become holy like God is holy, left to ourselves. You see, <clears throat> Paul even describes Satan or the sneaky snake as a prince of power because he does have power in this world. That we see in Luke chapter 4, just like the sneaky snake tempted Adam and Eve and they failed, they disobeyed God, they took of the fruit and they ate of the fruit that God told them, don't eat of that. You have all these other pleasures and all these other things that I've given you, but just don't eat of this one fruit. But the sneaky snake lied to them, tempted them, and they disobeyed God. Well, the sneaky snake went to Jesus. When Jesus went into the wilderness, and the sneaky snake tempted Jesus too. But this time, Jesus spoke back with the word of God. The sneaky snake even tempted Jesus by saying, listen, I will offer you the power of this world that I have. We know that the devil, the sneaky snake, he has power to tempt us and to deceive us. That we have followed him when we live in sin. But Jesus, unlike Adam and Eve, Jesus was tempted but never sinned. That is a great hope for us because what the Bible says is because of our sin, we are separated from God. We are dead in our sin. But Jesus, he never sinned. And so he is the one that can give us salvation. We're going to continue to read it. Ephesians verse 3, chapter 2. So among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. We need outside help, not based on our own merit, right? We can't earn salvation. So someone else has to do that for us. Just like we were talking about, we need a new battery for our phone. We need new life in our games. We need a new spiritual life. We need to be made new, made alive again, because we are dead. Not just dying, but we are dead, helpless, and we are headed for wrath and just and right punishment because of our sin. Our sin deserves punishment. You see, only people humble enough to recognize their own brokenness when we come to a place that we recognize that we have done things that are disobedient to God's perfect standard, when we recognize our brokenness, it's only then that we'll be capable of walking with other people through struggles that seem very different from our own. When we come to a realization that we don't deserve God's love, that left to ourselves, we are in desperate need of help because we cannot change ourselves. We try and we try and we try over and over again. We just let ourselves down. But when we come to a place where God can come and change us, we realize that we are no better than anyone else. It changes our hearts and we stop judging others for how sinful they are or for how different they are and we acknowledge our sin and we can take responsibility for the things that we've done, whether we do them on purpose or by accident, and we seek God for help. You see, when we get to that place, it enables us to love people and to get past the labels that we have for people for what they've done. And we see people like God sees people for who they are. That we are made in Christ. You want to do it with me? We are made in Christ. That when we recognize our sinfulness, we can start to see how God sees us as truly loved, made in Christ. We see people for who they are and not for what we have done. I'm going to read the next couple of verses in Ephesians. You follow along and then 
Well, I just want to share a couple things with you. Ephesians chapter 4, or Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 9 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. He seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of ourselves, but it's the gift of God, not a result of our works, so that no one can boast. You see, God is rich. Beyond all of our imagination, beyond all that we could even understand and comprehend, God is rich with heavenly blessings. And he has shown us his richness by giving us his mercy and his grace through Jesus. We're pretty rich too. Did you know that? Compared to the rest of the world. If we have like a dollar to our name, we're like 80% richer than the entire world. We have a lot of things. We have a lot of things that God's given us the ability to steward, right? And we have responsibilities for those things. But sometimes when I think of myself, I have a lot of things and I have a lot of money to give. And when someone comes to me in need, sometimes I can be kind of stingy with my money. And I take a look at my money before I even think about the other person's need. And I think about how much could I give instead of how much can I help And yet, when I look at God's love and how rich he is, he did not even spare his own son, but he gave up the most precious part of his riches for sinners like me, enemies of him, people who were disobedient to him, who pushed him away, and yet he chased me down and he poured his riches upon me. He did not hold back, but he freely gave all. You see, in this picture, this might be more of a picture of me. I have my pile of hundreds, and I just kind of sift through. Oh, no, not that one here. But no, God, in his love, he gave it all for us. He gave everything, the most precious part of his riches, so that we could be forgiven so that we could have great hope and great purpose, so that we could be made in Christ. The Bible says that now if we died with Christ and we believe that we also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. But death no longer has mastery over him. The death that Jesus died when God gave Jesus, Jesus willingly gave up his life, You see, the debt that we had to pay because of our sin, we deserve death. But Jesus, he came and he never sinned and he died for our sin. He took that death that we deserved and he put it upon himself. He took our sin and he put it upon himself. And when he died on the cross, he paid for the penalty of our sin. And the Bible says if we trust in what Jesus has done, not what we've done, but what he has done by giving up his life and dying on the cross, and three days later he came back from the grave, just by God's grace through faith, we can be saved. We can have great hope. God made us alive. When Jesus walked out of that tomb after three days, the same power that raised God from the dead now lives in us. What a great hope that is, that we can now call ourselves Christians, little Christs that follow after the living Jesus. We're going to do it together again. (laughs) We're made in Christ. God made us alive. We did not make ourselves alive again so that we cannot boast in anything. But he called our name, just like he called Lazarus out of the grave, he called my name. 
and he gave us new life. And he removed the grave clothes so we can walk with him, not just for the story to be over, but now he's calling us to a great purpose. You see, we're made in Christ and we're designed for God's purpose, his great purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This workmanship is a similar word to like our word for poem. It's created and manufactured. It's made. It's beautiful that we are a new creation, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, that we're made new again. You see, when God makes us new, he wants to make us like Jesus. He doesn't just want to make us better versions of ourselves. He wants to make us like Jesus. That we're not created in Christ Jesus with this great purpose to just live a happy life. We're not created in Christ Jesus to have our best life on earth. But what this says is we're made in Christ to do good works. Oftentimes, I get confused of what that means. To do good works or to have a good life. They're two different things sometimes in our definitions. But good doesn't always mean easy. It doesn't always mean clean and cut and clear. It doesn't always mean that it's not going to be painful. But oftentimes it means that we're going to be put in messy circumstances. We're going to be put in awkward situations. It's going to be uncomfortable. That we're going to have to do things that are confusing or don't make sense to other people. But we're doing what is right according to God's word. To live in obedience to God's word at all costs. To do good word works, it means to to care for people who cannot care for themselves. It means to not only be willing to sacrifice, but to sacrifice for the sake of others' needs. To be gentle when the world's telling us to be loud. To be full of hope when the world's telling us to worry. To love when the world's telling us to fight. To give up what we value most for the sake of following Jesus. And it might mean different things to different people, Parents, I really think oftentimes what this looks like for us is to give our children back to the Lord for they belong to him. That that is scary. But to trust God and his plan and his purposes for our kids, to continue to teach them what it looks like to sacrifice and to endure suffering in the light of eternal rewards. And for kids to lay down your things that you might want for the sake of being a joy to your parents. To learn to be what it looks like to be a joy to your parents, to respect, even when you desire to do something else. Springtide Research Institute partnered with Fuller Youth Institute in coming up with research about, this is how they titled it, Navigating Uncertainty, the 2021 State of Religion and Young People. And they surveyed over 10,000 people, and they had over, within that, I guess there were also interviews, and they concentrated their interviews and their research on people who were ages 13 to 25. And you know what they said? The number one thing that they came up with from this, navigating uncertainty, Young people wrestle with anxiety more than ever. And uncertainty is one of the biggest contributing factors to that anxiety. In December 7th, 2021 of last year, the U.S. Surgeon General, he issued a warning about the current mental health crisis. This was following a declaration of a national emergency of child and adolescent mental health. 
I'm going to be honest, I didn't even know. And yet, when we seek God's word, and when we look through even this survey and these things of research, there is hope and there is purpose in families, in community. The number one thing that they suggested was to help people find peers to help build positive character, to have, to have supportive adults in their life. You see, young people, they need us to be the people who welcome their questions, no matter what the questions are, to listen without judging, to have a space where they can ask questions about anything and not be judged for it. And they don't want us to just give them answers, but to give them a place where they can wrestle through these answers. Because a lot of their questions, they don't just have one right answer. You see, the brokenness that we're seeing, God wants to use that brokenness to provide a place for hope. And that is what God is doing in all of our lives. That he can use brokenness and he can make that into the most beautiful thing to help serve other people. Beyond just having peers and beyond just having supportive adults, the last thing they said is to help people serve. When we give up our own times, when we sacrifice, when we willingly give up things that we have to help other people, it changes us. You see, there is this, I've, I just discovered that, but there's this Japanese art form, it's called kintsugi. And what they do is this has been going on for centuries, but they take broken things and they make them like new. But when they do that, they highlight the brokenness. And that's what makes it beautiful. The brokenness is exposed and emphasized to reveal the beauty. You see, God is taking us in our brokenness and he is making us new and that brokenness that is shining through is not us, but it is Jesus. It is Christ's goodness and love. And he wants to use us in our brokenness to change the lives of the people around us. And that is what we have the opportunity to do this week. So as I close, I want to spend a few minutes just praying for those who are going to be involved in VBS. For those who aren't able to serve this week, we need your prayers. We need you to continue to be supportive of what's happening this week for the people who are with the children, the people who are leading, the people who are teaching, the people who are leading the crafts and the games and the snacks and all the things that are going to be talked about with missions and the hundreds of kids that will be here. Let's pray together that God would reveal himself and that through Jesus they would believe in his free gift of salvation. If you are volunteering... Could you just stand for a moment? We want to acknowledge you and we want to pray over you this morning. Church family, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these members of our body that have willingly given them their time and their resources to be here this week. We pray that you would be with them, that you would give them the strength that they need to minister, to serve, and to love these kids. Lord, we pray that you would give them the words to say. We pray that you would give them opportunities, that you would give them awareness for those small moments where they can have conversations about Jesus with these children. Lord, we pray for the kids. We pray that their hearts would be open. We pray for our own children that are going to be a part of EBS. Lord, we pray that you would change their hearts. Lord, we love you and we want to serve you. And Lord, we pray that you would use something as simple as VBS, Lord, that this would be a time where they would give their lives to following Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And church body, there's a way that we can be involved with praying for VBS. On your way out, there's little packets of Skittles. Um, if you don't like Skittles, that's okay. As you open it up and you take one out, Depending on the color, there's also like a list of prayer requests. 
So if you take out like a red one, you don't like it, you feed it to your dog. You still have, you still pray for the red thing on the list though, okay? Otherwise, like if you're someone that just wants to eat all the Skittles, you still have to go back and pray. We need your prayers, okay? So don't just cheat on that. But family, please be praying for God's work. We know that it's not our work, but we want to be willingly used by him. So church, have a great week. I'm so thankful for you. God bless you.